You can buy low and sell high. You can make money no matter what the market's doing. These ideas sound so simple, so easy to implement, yet for most of us, these ideas are next to impossible to achieve. And yet this is exactly what our next guest has done for his entire career. He's timed the markets with success. Milton Berg has been in finance since 1978 and he became a chartered financial analyst in 1979. At his advisory firm, he's worked with investment legends like Michael Steinhardt, George Soros, and Stan Druckenmiller. Today, we'll get Milton's thoughts on the stock and bond market and where he sees opportunities for investors. Milton, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining me today. Nice, nice to see you. Not everyone at Malden Economics is familiar with your work. Could you maybe just start out by explaining how you approach the markets? Because it's uh, it's it's a little different, right? You've got you've got macro, but you're also heavily into technicals and historical research. How does it all come together for you? Well, basically, it comes together is that the the key the key thing we look at is is turning points in the market. Uh, most uh, technicians or even retail investors institutions are, are basically trend followers. Uh, they see it, see it looks like a healthy market to get into it. It, it. The market is turning down for a few months. They get out of the market. Uh, they try to pick pick stocks. We try to recognize turning points in the market. In other words, we anticipate if the market is bottoming, we anticipate that a, a bottom is about to happen. We'll start buying into weakness, buy within the first few days of the, of the new bull market. We actually built the, over 30,000 models. Our models are, are geared to pinpoint uh, buying or selling periods within, say, 10 days of a top or 10 days of a bottom. It, it's more precise at bottom than it, than it is at tops. And again, we only work with probabilities. We will not be right 100% of the time. We will not be right 80% of the time. I think probably 60 to 70% of the time. And there's risk risk management involved. In other words, it's, it's great to sit here and make a, a long-term view and say we'll have hyperinflation uh, 10 years out. What if I'm wrong? You know, we have to, things, right. are, things, things fluctuate. Things are uh, nothing is clear. So we, uh, we we maintain flexibility, but basically we're following data and following indicators rather than following feelings. We like to think, use data rather than trade based on the way we feel, because that's the mistake most people make is trading based on what they feel about the markets rather than what the data is telling them. So I read that in one of the papers that you wrote back in 2015, where you said that you track 30,000 indicators. How, how is that even possible? Well, to... It's only possible because we're in the computer age. You know, when I was first got into the business, that actually would have been impossible. But uh, we don't look at 30,000 indicators every day. The computer uh, pops out those indicators that, that are flashing a signal any given day. Most of the signals are not actionable. In other words, if the uh, if the advanced decline line was 10, 10, 10 to 1 downside yesterday, 10 times as many downside stocks as upside yesterday, 100, we, that flashed out. It's a rare occurrence, but it's not it's not, it's not uh, something you can trade on because it happens randomly. It happens both in bull markets and in bill markets. It happens at turning points and not at turning points. But it's a piece of data that we, we act. Now, sometimes a combination of data is going to work. It, it is not, it's not actually the case, but you get a 10 to 1 downside issue ratio in the S&P coupled with high put call ratio, and maybe that in the past has always suggested a turning point. So we look at these indicators, we look at them in combination form as well, and we're looking for rarities. We're not looking for uh, conventional moving average crosses, which most of Fibonacci retracements is the most technical you look at. We look at rarities that generally occur at, at or around turning points in the market. So these 30,000 indicators, what are they telling you today about the U.S. stock market? How do you feel about the market today? I wish I could pound on the table and say bull market ahead, but the indicators are telling us bull market ahead, believe it or not. Well, let me give you a little bit of a background. Okay. And strangely enough, uh, I'm, I, I say the, bull the bear market ended in June, kind of strange. Since June, interest rates went up dramatically and, and the Fed has been tightened dramatically. But the S&P never got more than 3% below its June lows. The Russell 2000 never broke its June lows. So we saw panic in June. Our indicators were telling us that the June low was significant with a lot of gaps on the downside. The seven-day AD ratio of the S&P was at a level, an oversold level that you see at market bottoms. So the, we're calling the bear market bottom took place in June. The first rally was a rally into August, about 17% in the S&P. We now have a rally in the S&P roughly about 12 or 13% on a closing basis. So these are early rallies in bull markets. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're going to get a bull market like we saw from uh, 2000, either after 2003 low or after the 2008 low, 2009 low. But I just think that there's, we're still headed to the upside. 
for the intermediate term, and maybe the bear market continues, or maybe make lower lows sometimes later next year. But right now, the trend or the, the trade should be to the upside. We have many, many indicators that flash signals in, in, in late June and in early July, and again in October. I can review them, but it's sometimes boring mentioning indicators themselves. But our view is, low is in June, the market tested the low, all over the world, people are acting. It feels as if we're in a bear market. It feels as if the market is down, but it's not. The market is, SP is way above where it was in June. The Russell 2000 is way above where it was in June, as is the NASDAQ. So also the SOX, the, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, is up over 30% since the bottom in October. This is not bear market action. Another thing I want to point out is that um, everyone talks about bear market. You've heard this bear market rally. This rally is a bear market rally. Well, the 17% rally we had into the October, into the August highs, if it was a bear market rally, would have been the greatest bear market rally ever after a decline of only 23% of the S&P 500. S&P only declined 23%, never had a 17% rally in a bear market when the decline was only 23%. Even now, we're down 25% off the up January highs into the October lows, we've rallied 12.5%. Never has been a 12.5% bear market rally after the decline of 25%. So the rally itself, either something is very different, which might be the case, which means the real bear market hasn't started yet, which would fit with my thesis that we're at a bull move now, maybe get a mine in new high next year and then get a bear market. That would make the most sense. But to call the bear market rally is very, very uh, incorrect if you look at the history of bear market rallies. Okay. Well, let's take a, a tour of some of the other global uh, major asset classes. And maybe we could start with uh, long bonds because uh, it looks like we may be getting closer to the end of a hiking cycle mm -hmm. than, than, than the middle. Um, well, how do you feel the, about bonds? Oh, bonds are very important. Very One of the most important components for markets worldwide. First of all, the, the US bond market is one of the broadest markets. I think second to gold is one of the broadest markets in the world. And um, we had a great bull market in stocks from 1982 to the year 2000, 2022, basically. We had a new mm -hmm. January, a great bull market. Guess what? That bull market was accompanied by the greatest bull market history in bonds. So we can't isolate stocks from bonds. I think one of the reasons we had this great bull market in stocks is because we had a great bull market in bonds. In fact, the research that we did, which is sort of proprietary, we haven't shared it with anybody, is that somebody bought a, a, a zero coupon 30-year bond in 1981 and rolled it each year to another 30-year zero coupon bond. His return until the bond market peak in March of 2020, 20, uh, 2020 would have been more than 18% per annum, far better than the SP 500. Wow. So we believe we're in a new, a new long-term bear market in bonds. Uh, the bull market has ended. And being that we're in a new bear market in bonds, probably the stock market cannot do as well over the next 30 years or so as it did over the last 30 years or so. Not I saying think, the market will go down, just to say that you don't have the bonds behind it pushing the market up. I think Gary Schilling may have actually done what you what you suggested. Gary Schilling, I, 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 Gary Schilling was was a, a, such an underrated economist, and I, I'll tell you a story. I had a, I started a little hedge fund in 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 in, uh, in, uh, in, in mid '80s, and I was walking down the street and I saw some some books being sold, and one was Gary Schilling, Schilling's book on is inflation is inflation over. It was sold in like as as a as an ex, extra. It was extra printing. No one wanted to buy the book. And there was a, a remainder. Record. That was the most amazing book. He sort of predicted the end of inflation, which nobody, nobody thought was happening. Yeah. Everyone thought there's inflation, inflation around the corner, inflation around the corner. Meantime, from 1986 to 2020 to 2022, there's really no inflation. It, it was it was disinflationary. He, he's a great a great economist. And he actually did do that. And he actually, if you read his newsletter, which I do read his his, his newsletter, yeah, you know he says the reason his family is able to uh, they're wealthy is strictly because this is exactly yeah, yeah. what they did and. He's yeah. a fellow who analyzes markets and puts his money where his mouth is. I really, really respect him for what he has done. Yeah, agreed. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. So, so what do you feel uh, about the U.S. dollar? Because uh, oh well, now of course you know it's a funny thing to say there hasn't been inflation for the last thirty years. There has been inflation, but the inflation didn't occur in in, in um, right in consumer prices. The inflation wasn't asset prices. It wasn't bonds, and it wasn't stocks. And uh, it actually wasn't gold as well. Gold bottomed in, at two hundred fifty dollars or so in nineteen in two in uh, um, two thousand. Excuse me. Yeah, roughly two thousand or so. And then it uh, next, the last twenty years, a major boom in gold. So there was inflation, everything other than consumer prices. 
And now the cat is out of the bag. There's inflation, consumer prices. It's very hard to get back to very hard to get back to where we were to get to get inflation back down. And uh, so I think we're in an inflationary period. Inflation is a terrible tax. It's a terrible tax on the on on, on the wealthy, but it's even a greater tax on on, on working people who. Sure. And, and this is it's just a terrible thing. And that's because you have you know we don't, we have governments in control of our money supply and government is in control of our spending. And, and 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 you know in, in the United States Congress, it, you know the majority of the Congress people or senators are, are lawyers in the background. Right. Lawyers. Do you know of anyone who's an economist? No, I, think I don't. One maybe who has some good economic background. So, so you know, there's, there's spending money we don't have. They don't understand that in the history of the world, all goods and services have been scarce. It's a scarcity of goods and services. It's a pricing. It's a cost of interest and the cost of uh, of, of 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 goods and services which. Give us a message of what we can buy and what we can sell, and 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 they you know the, the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government by spending what they don't have has basically um, uh, um, disrupted the message that pricing is supposed to give us. So uh, we're, we uh, things aren't going to be so so great in the future, but you know we're not calling for a dep depression so, over. So are you calling for higher level of baseline inflation for longer than people expect? This, Would that this be is fair? What, this, is what, this is what I think. You, you can't know. Inflation is a monetary phenomenon. I know people talk about supply chains and shortages. In the history of the world, all inflation is caused by more money than more money. The money increase to a great extent than goods increase and goods and services increase. And this has been going on for decades where the Federal Reserve has been basically, I don't want to use the word printing because right. they don't really print. They've been allowing credit to increase, debt and credit to increase. Now, if you get a, a, an honest Federal Reserve, if Jerome Powell is honest, and he wants to get inflation back down to 2% or lower, it's going to be very, very difficult for our, for our, our economy. It's going to be very difficult. Rates are going to have to go, go high. And uh, it's probably going to be very, very deflationary, very, very uh, deflationary, very, very negative for the economy. On the other hand, if that happens, the United States can't pay down the debts. Because if rates go up, and the United States has been borrowing on the short end, uh, they they won't be able to pay down their debt except if they raise taxes, and, and if they raise taxes to the extent they can pay down the debt, it's going to be again very deflationary, very depressionary. So there's most like so the, the the choice is the Federal Reserve. Are they honest and they want to have real money and they don't want they don't want to have, have they want the fiat money to be strong, or do they say listen we we can't allow a government to go bankrupt we can't allow a government to to uh, raise taxes to 60, 70, 80 percent to cover their debts. And we're going to uh, increase money supply. So it's really, it depends on what the Fed does, but it's, it's a choice. Either we have strong, strong inflation in the future, if there, it's, it's a dishonest Fed, or you have uh, um, a uh, inflationary period, if, excuse, or a deflationary period if they really want to have sound money in the United States. I think this sort of leads into uh, an asset class that I think confuses a lot of people, and that's gold. It right? really hasn't performed as well as I think most people would expect in an inflationary environment. Is that really a function of the, the strength of the dollar up until now? Or is there another reason why you feel gold maybe is lagging a little bit? And what's your, you know, what's your forecast? My, I believe that gold is acting very, very well. If you look at the history of gold, gold is not, there's no retained assets in gold. There's no retained earnings. The price of gold is not the price of a, of a stock. It's not a price of a, uh, of a uh, you know, a stock like Apple, a couple, a couple like Apple computer. They, they they manufacture things. They they make money and they retain their earnings and they pay earnings to shareholders. Gold is an asset that should maintain its val inflationary value, it maintain its value over the years, over the decades. And gold has, in fact, going back a hundred years uh, or so, gold has returned more than three percent per annum, uh, with, uh, or three or four percent per annum, which is above the inflation rate over that period. That's all gold is supposed to do. Now, gold is very cyclical, and therefore you have big moves up and big moves down in gold. But the, the fact that you have inflation now does not tell you that gold has to move up in price right now. A great a prime example is from 1980 to, to, to the year 2000, gold collapsed from $850 per ounce to $250 per ounce, while the CPI doubled. Again, CPI doubled, gold is cut more than half. Gold does not track inflation on a year-to-year -year basis. But over the long term, gold maintains its value in an inflationary environment. That is why people who are smart and want to keep, keep their assets for themselves or for the children or the grandchildren, keep it in gold. Because if it's in gold, it's in your, your safe deposit box, or if it's in your, 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 your safe, it will not be taxed. You don't pay dividend interest on the, on the income. 
it, it won't go bankrupt, but it's going to maintain its value. So if you want to buy your, your child a Lamborghini, you want to put uh, $300,000 worth of gold in a safe deposit box, you tell them, my, my six-year-old grandson, when you're 36 years old, just take these, 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 this gold, you'll buy a Lamborghini then. In other words, it will maintain its value. You can't say that with any, any other currency. And I'm sure you can say that with, with, with Bitcoin either, because I don't th think Bitcoin is actually a currency. That's just my opinion as well. But gold has been a great method of maintaining long-term value. Uh, and again, you don't pay taxes on it. Well, you bring up Bitcoin, and, and I know that through your work, you follow Bitcoin, and yet you, you indicate that you don't believe in Bitcoin. Yeah. So what, what, what are your thoughts exactly right, on well, Bitcoin? Well, anything that trades is a trading vehicle, right? The Bitcoin trades. I, I truthfully, I, a relative of mine bought Bitcoin at $0.04, cents and he sold it at $0.08 cents because he doubled his money. You know, he was in, you know, Bitcoin when it first started. Um, I never understood Bitcoin because I, I, the way I understand currencies is that currencies basically either have an intrinsic value, such as gold, or it's, it's fiat value. The government says you can use this currency to pay government debts, to pay taxes, and therefore it has that value because government declares its value. Of course, the government backs it with their army, with their with the guns and their and their army. That's how they right. back the currency. I mean, but um, Bitcoin it does not have any intrinsic value at all. It has scarcity, but it doesn't have any intrinsic value. So there's really no reason for Bitcoin to go up in price. Uh, there's no intrinsic value in it. It could be used as a, as a, as a means of, of trading or a means of buying or selling goods. But uh, I just don't believe in the idea that Bitcoin should 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 uh, increase in value. And again, the fact that it's lack it's not it's not a nat it's not natural money. See, uh, let me tell you my view about money in general, which I, you don't hear from too many people. And that is that in the modern era, there should no it should not be any Federal Reserve. Money is so easy. In other words, you have, if I want to buy a, a, a um, I want to go to a store and buy a shirt, I should be able to take my 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 iPhone out and give you a, a, a fraction of a share of Apple to pay for my shirt, or I can give you a, a, a some a fraction of an ounce of gold that have an ETF to buy my shirt, or I can uh, I can take copper which I own in the futures and, and buy my buy the shirt. In other words, nowadays that everything is fungible, everything is transportable. I can go to Hong Kong on vacation and have the same Apple computer uh, stock that I have in New York and trade with it on my, in other words, money, the way money evolved is money was something valuable that you can give to people in return for something else. Right. Now, the, now there's so many things you can give in return for other things. The only problem is that government got involved. And nowadays, any transaction, if I want to sell my Apple shares, there's a tax, a capital gains tax. If I want to sell my physical gold, I don't want to hide it from the government. I have to pay a capital gains on the gold that I bought. So therefore, all these things that I value can no longer be used in transactions. But if the Federal Reserve, if central banks throughout the world would shut down, and if governments would eliminate capital gains taxes, there'd be no need for money. Because any, any asset a person owns is his money. It could be traded. It could be, it could be divided into, into different uh, portions, and, and, and it could do transactions based on that. So this is a Radical view, but I think this is the most logical view. I think if not for the fact that governments placed, uh, created fiat money, created central banks, and created taxation and capital gains, I think it'd be, there's so much natural money uh, that in the modern era that could be used. There's no need to have gold. There's no need to have Bitcoin. You know, I could uh, sell a share of my business. If I wanted to buy a house someplace, I could sign a share of my business to the fellow. But the problem is now I have to, uh, uh, you know, there are many things you can do. It seems like that is the is the area where uh, the the technology behind cryptocurrency could actually add value, right? Yes, With a, a blockchain. Blockchain. Open blockchain. Oh, I'm not against blockchain. Yeah. Blockchain is probably one of the greatest inventions in history, at least in financial history. Anyway, it's amazing blockchain. But the fact that blockchain is a viable a viable product does not mean Bitcoin is a viable product. Blockchain right. could be used for trading anything, and that's exactly if they eliminate capital gains. Maintain the blockchain, um, the, the blockchain um, uh, intellectual ideas. You certainly, certainly could have money that is far greater than Bitcoin, far more flexible than Bitcoin. Just so your idea about transferring value and transferring wealth, um, it, it, it's really interesting. I could see how the U.S. government in particular would have a real problem with that, uh, but given the status of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency, uh, how do you feel about the U.S. dollar maintaining that reserve status? The U.S. dollar I don't, is, is basically a joke. 
I mean, is a dollar today in any way representative to a dollar 100 years ago? A dollar's worth two cents to what it was 100 years ago. Fiat currencies and is, is, is one of the great ways governments use to steal money from the people through inflation. So on a very short-term basis, a dollar is great. You have a strong dollar. You could buy and sell with the dollar, but it, it can't be used to hold hold any value. If you use for transactions, it can't be used to hold any value. So, so you know, I, there should be better alternatives than the dollar. I'm, I'm not knocking the dollar in the sense that it, it, it's very, very functional. It works very, very well on a short-term basis, but it, you can't, you know, saving dollars makes no sense. And even buying bonds, if you're not buying it in a retirement account, you have to pay interest on the, you have to pay interest on the, on the, on the on, uh, you have to pay, pay tax the interest you're receiving. Right. That again, it reduces the value you're, you're getting. One benefit of gold is that gold maintains its inflationary value, but you don't pay tax on its increase. That's one of the benefits of uh, of owning stocks as well, because the, the companies, although there's double taxation, unfortunately, companies pay tax and you pay tax on income. But you don't pay tax on the capital gain until you sell the stock. Of course, you have some senators who are totally economic uh, illiterates, like uh, uh, Senator Warren, who suggests some um, taxing unrealized capital gains. I mean, she said, let's just take two pennies. It's not two pennies. Believe me, nobody out there in the real world who owns a stock is paying two pennies. It's two pennies of every of every hundred dollars that you own, which is right. very, 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 uh, rep very, very repressive taxation. And the, again, the limited economic illiterates in the government, and you just can't do that. I want to get back to your uh, your process a little bit, Milton, because you wrote a paper back in July of 2015 that you have on your website. I found it really, uh, re really eye opening. There's a couple of bullet points that I wanted to just read to you, your own words, uh, just, just to get a little bit more explanation on how you think about your process. So point number 23, you say the, the stock market is, uh, is an economic system, not a physical system. Yes. And then 24, behavior of the stock market cannot be compared to the emission of alpha particles and radioactive decay, right. Right. nor can it be compared to a pair of dice or a roulette wheel. Uh, w w what are you getting at with those two wow. statements? Okay, great, great. You brought up very interesting statements. They talk about momentum in the stock market. Momentum is a physical attribute. There's no such thing of momentum when it comes to stock prices. Every given stock price is separate from the, day, the from the previous stock price. It's a buyer and a seller agreeing to a price. It it's it looks like a momentum because you're looking at a chart, but there's no actual momentum behind the movement. It's a, it's a, it, each transaction is separate and independent from the previous transaction. So the idea of calling it a, a momentum is a physical property. All stock prices, all asset prices that trade in free markets basically represent the thoughts in people's heads. I'm willing to pay, I think it's worth this much. I'm willing to pay this much. I think it's gonna go higher, I'm willing to pay this much. I'm willing to sell this at this price because I think it's gonna go lower because I need to pay for, I need, I need my money for my mortgage payment. So, so we have to analyze stocks using the idea that it's the buyer and the seller's decision that moves stock prices. It's a willingness of, of, of someone to pay more for a stock that takes the price up it's willing for someone to sell a stock at a lower price that, that, than it was trading previously for the price of the stock to go down. These emotional components are, show up in price action. Let me give you an example. You, I, I note that nearly all bear market bottoms in the past have occurred on major increases in five-day volume. Usually five-day volume is the highest in one year, two years, or three years at market lows. Now, why is that? Why is that? That is basically because there's some emotional involvement where people say, I got to get out of this stock. And, and, and other people are coming in and say, well, I'm not going to buy your stock unless it goes down to a lower level. And you, you find sort of, a, sort of a balance. But the point is, the data we look at, while it seems it's reflecting economic data or market data, it's really just reflecting emotional data. It's reflecting the, the, what goes on in the mind of the buyer because the mind of the seller. And this is not just retail investors. We're talking about big institutions. We're talking about, you know, uh, even, even the, the FTX and so on. You know, what went on in the minds of these, of these people who invested in them who didn't do, do, do their due diligence? It was very an emotional extreme, emotional high. Bitcoin, blockchain, trading on an exchange, making money. And these are the things that show up in our indicators. So we use indicators like put calls, we look volume, we, we have ratios, assets, assets. These things don't, aren't reflective of, 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 of economic data or physical data is reflective of emotional data and um, 
and, and I think that's what turns markets and that what gets markets to move. I mean, who can explain how for a number of years, in, in, in the past few years, Germany was able to sell 30-year bonds at a negative discount rate, negative interest rate. Does that make any sense in the log logically? It makes it any economic basis. Could it have been predicted in the past? Of course not. But there's some cuckoo things going on in some people's heads. Either the central bank is being investors and so on. And, and this is what we measure. We're measuring emotional changes. I don't, I don't know if I'm articulating that well, but yes. we don't look at the we don't look at the economy, we don't look at the stock market as a physical system. I'll give you the basic example. Long-term capital market went bankrupt. You know, you had, you had Myron Scholes. Um, as one of the, on the board of directors, you have so the super geniuses in the economic field on the board of directors of long-term capital market, and they 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 blew up. Why did they blow up? Because they looked at the their, the bond market as a physical system. They said, since in the past the spread between the, the, this bond and that bond has never been greater than eight eight basis points, it will never again be greater than eight, eight basis points. But why? I can say a dice that it will never it will, it will never show up with a thirteen. I can. Be, Guarantee, because the physical system, the maximum number you can get when you shoot a dice is 12. There's no minimum or maximum when it comes to spreads in markets. It depends on environment, it depends on, on, on the emotions. Mm -hmm. So they, they said it was a four sigma event, meaning it's in, in the history of the world, something like that blow up never should have happened. That's because they misinterpret of the economy and misinterpret the economic models. You can't look at the model and say, what happened in the past, or what never happened in the past will never happen in the future. It just, it just cannot be said. You have to analyze um, the markets as as, as the, the trading is taking place. Bill, one of the other things that you wrote about in your in your paper is that you you use your indicators primarily to look for anomalies or extremes, extreme readings, and that's where your indicators are the most helpful. And you've touched on that a little bit, but could you go a little bit deeper into how that informs your process and your strategy? Well, we believe, or I believe, that on a general daily basis, the movement of asset prices, capital markets is random. See, most people say, oh, well, the market went up today because uh, 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 Jerome Powell sneezed, or the market went, went down yesterday because Apple's having a strike in China. But really, we believe that the day-to-day, -day, actually, the market is random. And the random in the sense that it can't be predicted. The day-to-day -day movements can't be predicted. And uh, because you can't predict people's decisions on what to buy, what to sell. However, we believe at turning points, at turning points, it, 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 it can, you have a high probability of, of, of predicting the turning point because when it, at turning points, you see extremes in actions in, in, in the way people act in markets. And uh, basically, we don't, we don't get this through our own intellectual understanding of markets. We get through through history. As I pointed out, we notice that most market lows take place in an increase in volume. We know now that most market lows take place with increase in put call ratios. We know that most market lows take place when the economy is in a recession. We know that most market lows take place when the real estate is not doing well. In other words, no stock market lows. So we try to, try to find certain um, uh, extremes. Now we look, look at many, for example, I mean, we had an extreme in, in, in October. In, in, on October 4th, in the SP 500, if you look at the, the up stocks versus the down stocks, the volume in the up stocks was 293 times as much as the volume in the down stocks in the day. It's only happened six times in the past. Each wow. time was early on in, in a bull market. Now, you know, the S&P bottom is September 30th. This took place on October 4th. The October 12th low in the S&P was only a quarter of a percent below the September 30th low. This is fitting with history. This takes place early on in bull markets. These types of extremes. Now, why? Why would all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you'll see 293 times as much upside volume as downside volume SP 500? I don't know why. I know it's indicative of some sort of a change that's going on in the minds of buyers and sellers. Either the sellers have been so washed out that only buyers were able to come in and they took the volume up, or it could be that there's so many, so much cash on the side that uh, you know people uh, don't know what to do with it. They got I, I don't know the reason for it, but I do know this aberration, this this rare data is telling us there's been a change taking place. Another change took place was what took place on uh, October 13th. The market let's be on October 12th closed a quarter percent below its September 30th low and about two and a half percent below its June low. Well, all of a sudden on, on October uh, 13th, there was some, some CPI news. The market collapsed into the open, reversed up. If you look at the bar, it's it's uh, you know it's one of the most one of the most significant reversals in decades. And that's also a sign. I can't tell you why that happened. I can tell you why a poor CPI print took the market up on the day after taking it down early in the day. But I do know that, that type of a reversal often takes place in, 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 at bottoms. Now, it's not 
generally doesn't take place at stock market bottoms. That type of reversal most often takes place in commodity, commodity bottoms, in gold and silver and copper and so on and so forth. But we saw that type of a bottom. Another reason to think that the market is headed higher, and of course, we're up uh, uh, on intraday base, we're up over 15% off that low. Maybe that's all the rally you're going to get. I don't think so. But the reality is, is that that's, these are the kind of things we look for. Uh, we look for aberrations that take place at turning points, which suggest to me that something has changed. I don't have to know what changed. See, most, most pundits want to tell you, well, change in Federal Reserve policy, change in inflation, change in... I just say there's a change in the, in the willingness of buyers to buy and of sellers to sell. And that shows up in the prices and shows up in our indicators. Bill, you're obviously a, a very sophisticated individual and investor and your clients, uh, hedge funds, pension funds, banks, uh, family offices, also very sophisticated and able to employ sophisticated strategies for investing. What do you say to an individual investor? who's maybe looking at this market and completely confused, because we hear that a lot from, from our readers and our customers. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's very difficult for an investor to trade the markets and investors yeah. is much easier for them to, to invest, in the, invest in markets. And if I can give any advice to, to an individual investor, first of all, um, I don't think now's the time to be in the bond market, number one, okay? So that's, I'd say you really can't consider being in bonds. I would say if you want to uh, maintain, if you're a young investor and you want to maintain uh, um, the value of your of your savings, of course you have to put a portion in gold because gold historically maintains its value. You're not buying gold to make money. It's a mistake. You're not making gold to, because when inflation is ten percent, gold will go up thirty percent. That's not why you're buying gold. You're buying gold now. Thirty years from now, it should maintain its value. That's one thing. The most important thing, which is sort of contrary to what you think I'd say, is that you will not find a company that has great management. Because management has, 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 a, has a piece in the action, they own part of the company, and they care about their shareholders and care about making money for the shareholders. They don't care about the pleasing the government. They don't care about ESG. They don't care about diversity. They don't care, they, they, all they care about is making money for the clients. The prime person was, of course, uh, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett started at Berkshire Hathaway, and his prime goal was to make money for himself and for his clients. And um, Apple was also, it, Apple Computer is a great company. You know, they're uh, very well managed. You don't really care about the product. You can't predict, you know, the, the economic future for certain products, for electric cars, or for gas-powered cars. Or you really want to find a, a company that has a management that's on your side. And uh, you know, I, I don't want to make any particular recommendations now. I'd sure. say that you know, um, I'd say that Amazon was once an example, but now that uh, Jeff Bezos was a great manager of the first company, but now that he's no longer managing the company. You know, I don't care that they sell, they, they do great selling the books. It doesn't have the great management that, that they used to have. But I would say for the long-term basis, find companies that have great management whose interests are your interests. That's, that itself is not, not, not easy to do, but it's easier to do than trying to trade the market and try to get in and out and try to try to make money that way. But there's only a portion of your money in gold. I wouldn't recommend bonds. I think we're in a long-term bear market on bonds. And I would say um, if you're going to put the park your money, Park it with a management that's really on your side and have have a, a piece of the action themselves. They own, own part of the company. Milenberg, this was a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate you taking some time. I hope we can do this again soon. This was I, I only got to half of my questions, but this well, was uh, I, this I, was I incredible. To, I only got to fraction of my answers. I enjoyed it. Thank <laughs> you so much. I appreciate it. We'll do it again. Thanks, okay. Milton. Thanks for watching this week's global macro update from Malden Economics. Take a minute to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Ed D'Agostino. See you next week.